Who's your emergency contact? Who should we notify in the case of death? Welcome to the USP, where I spent the last two plus decades of my life. <clears throat> now I'm taking you through the course of the journey that I've been on for the last 23 years and eight months. You know, it's hard to fathom that you could be any place for two plus decades. Us out here trying to for forecast our future, trying to make plans and stuff, what we're gonna be five years from now, 10 years from now, and so on. We can't even wrap our head around trying to see or trying to predict anything two decades into the future. So when I was placed in the penitentiary, given a 26 year sentence, I didn't have a game plan to come home because I didn't feel like I was ever gonna make it home, especially the environment that they sent me to. You know, they first sent me to Lompoc and on the very first day and every week after that, people were getting chopped up for whatever reason. And I was exposed to the violence. I was there to observe it and even participated in some of them. So when you live in an environment like that, <clears throat> it's hard to say, hey, I'm gonna save this much money. So 20 years from now, when I come home, I'll have a nest egg or anything. So my objective in there was just the everyday grind. I get up 5.30 in the morning, doors close back then at 10 o'clock, now they close at 8.30, 9.15. So my objective is, how do I get through the day? What am I gonna do today to make me some money so I don't have to call home so I can take care of the things that I need to take care of? There's all sorts of ways to hustle. I was fortunate enough when I got to Atwater and other places that I've been, that my reputation, my name, was came with a, a level of trust and respect. So anybody that was moving anything on the compound, they sought me out. Because I'm not, because me being Asian, Cambodian specifically, as I've told you, I don't fall into the categories of the black, white, and Mexicans where they have the, all the racial animosity towards each other because of the history, not just out in the, not just in the penitentiary, but out here in the world. You know, we've been beefing for whatever. And the most of the yards that I've been on is the California yards, Lompoc, Victorville, and Atwater. So being on the California yard, I'm exposed to the California politics. I say California politics because each different penitentiary throughout the country, depending on the group of people you have there in the region you're in, the racial politics might vary. I mean, there's always gonna be a line drawn between gangs and race when it comes to war, when it comes to beef. But for the most part, the politics are a little different towards the East Coast than it is in the West Coast. On the East Coast, Mexicans and whites, they interact a lot more than they do on the West Coast. The West Coast, the California prisons are run by the MAs and the brand. The brand is the Aryan Brotherhood. And me personally believe that they keep the racial tension because one, it keeps them control over their own people. And two, you know, they benefit from it. They don't want everybody freelancing and building to get along and doing the things that they do. I mean, everything, everything that's inserted in this place comes with reasons. Maybe some of them I don't understand or some of them that I don't agree with, but that's just the politics that's in there. But me being on the California yard, I didn't mind it too much because the politics in place benefited me. Because if a Mexican dude comes up with something, if a black dude comes up with something, if a white dude comes up with something, they're gonna seek me out to go interact 
and be the in-between between them and these other racial groups that they're not really allowed to deal with on a certain level. And plus, they know that I can be trusted. If somebody comes to me and say, oh, who's got this? Where did you get this from? They already know better in the first place to even ask me those kind of questions. But if they insist, I'm just going to let them know, hey, this is what I got. You want it or not? Don't matter where it came from. Matter of fact, it's mine. So what do you want to do? You can say nay, yay, move on, or whatever. I try to keep everything simple. So when I got to Atwater, I was fortunate enough to hook up with this guy named uh, Lo. He's out of New York. He's black, like my size. He's maybe about 5'6", maybe 5'7". He's a vegetarian. But when you see him, the dude is cut up. All he does is work out two, three times a day, eats peanut butter sandwiches and soup or whatever. He just, he doesn't eat any meat. He might have ate a little fish, but I don't even want to say he did that. He, you know, he just ate beans and rice and soups, but he was really healthy. Now, I don't know his real name because I don't ever ask people about their real name or whatever, but... He's been in the system a long time. He's been in there since he was in a juvie. You know, out of New York, he's got bodies on his case. But for whatever reason, he's still up for parole. He's still under the old law where you can still get parole. And at this time, he was getting close to seeing the board. But he ended up getting caught up with a cell phone. So... Went to the shoe and got shipped out to another place and then ended up getting caught up the same thing. You know, a lot of these people that are able to make moves and stuff in the penitentiary are people that have not just connections, but are respected by their people. That's what allows them to give them the connection. So when you see somebody making moves, you already know this is somebody that people respect and trust because the things that they're moving coming into the penitentiary could, pot could potentially be a RICO case, introduction case, money laundering case, or compromising a staff case. So for people to deal with these individuals, people that around them have to feel like they, someone they can be trusted. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of how we get certain things into the penitentiary because for one, if you have certain people watching these videos that are law enforcement or COs working prisons, I don't want to give up the game for the people that are still in there, incarcerated, that are still trying to hustle. You know, at the same time, the things that we're doing, it's not just the money, but we get a certain gratification of beating the system. Well, in this particular time, we receive a box. And in the box, I never saw the box, but I know it comes in a box. And it still baffles me how they were able to get the things they got in at one time. We got six cell phones, a pound of Purple Kush, a half pound of Chronic, and like five cans of tobacco. It was a pretty good sized box. So when the box hit my block, wherever it came from, however they got it, Lope lived in my block. He lived about eight cells to the right of me if I'm coming out of my cell. I'm in 101, and he lived at maybe at nine or 10. <clears throat> he comes to my cell. He goes, hey, come check this out. This is what I got. I go in the cell. He shows me two cell phones. He said, I got six of these. Help me move them, and I got something else for you. So, because one, I mean, for a lack of a better term, he's the man. He's got the stuff. So he needs to be protected because if other people know that he's got all this stuff, there's always jealousy and envy in the penitentiary. There's jealousy and envy out here in the streets too, I'm pretty sure. But 
is worse in the penitentiary because there's no way for you to go, no way for you to hide from all these eyes. Now everybody worries about the cameras that's in the units, but those aren't the, those aren't the things you have to worry about because those cameras aren't in your cell. Those cameras are not privy to private conversations. The one thing that we always have to be aware of in a penitentiary is these other freaking inmates sitting around us because a lot of them are miserable. A lot of them are envious and a lot of them are jealous. So when I move around, I'm conscious of it. I've told you before, I don't make a lot of friends. Unless somebody introduced me to them personally, I don't deal with them. Everybody else, I say hi and bye. Like there's a lot of people that I'm cool with, but they're not still not privy to the informa information or conversations that I have on certain things. And you have to operate like that. If you're in a penitentiary, first rule is trust no one. At the end of the day, the only person that you can rely on is yourself. And I mean that with your money, with your livelihood, with your safety, with your mental state. You are the only one that you can rely on. Now, some people can't even rely on themselves because they know they're a douchebag. But if you're carrying yourself the way you're supposed to carry yourself, you have a better understanding than anybody else around you of what you're capable of, of what you're willing to do and not willing to do. You can be part of a gang. You can be part of a group where it's regional, out state, this state, that state, or this ethnic group, or this gang. But just being a part of a gang does not mean that every one of them dudes is gonna have your back. Because as I've repeated, a lot of times when you get into things, it's your own people, your own gang members, your own group, your own race is the one that's going to end up coming to punish you. Believe that. The reason that is because whatever you do, they're not going to allow some other race, some other person that's not part of your car or anything like that to come and make a move on you. So when you fuck up, they're the ones going to deal with you. But of course, through the course of my time, I built relationships with individuals, not just from my own car, which is the Asian Islander car, but blacks, Mexicans, whites, where they've came and told me, hey, right or wrong, I got you. And those relationships exist. And those are the relationships that I still keep, that I communicate with, that I still show love to when possible, you know? But back to the hustle. There's 101 ways to hustle. Some people draw cards for holidays. Some people cook food. Some people gamble. I ran a poker table. I ran a dice game. And I dip and dab in everything that comes through that gate. So this particular time, like I said, dude brought me two cell phones. He said, I got four more. Help me move them. I sold, all, I sold four of them for him. I think he gave one to one of his buddy. And I kept one. Well, I bought one. But I bought one at a discount. The phones at the time were going anywhere between 2500 to 2800 I got mine for 2 k but I didn't have, but my homeboy Jay, the one that had comment on my videos about, you know, Atwater was one of the first, one of the places that he had the most fun at compared to all these other spots. And the reason that it was that way is because we made it that way. You know, we made, we set the standards for our, for our homies to live up to. And if they couldn't live up to it, we got rid of them. You know, it's nothing personal, but you don't want to be around people that are going to be detrimental to your health, whether they're stealing, whether they're sex offenders, whether they're telling, whether they're just doing grimy shit. Because we can't leave this bubble. 
We have to coexist, not just amongst ourselves, but with every group around us. And me personally, I touch everything that is in the penitentiary. So my reputation, my name is most important to me. If I conduct myself a certain way, I'm not gonna allow somebody just because he's Asian or Islander, that's a piece of shit to be walking around because his presence is gonna smear my name because the people that deal with me is, is gonna wonder, damn Mesa, I thought you was this type of dude. If you're this type of dude, why are you hanging around with this scumbag? Or why you have this scumbag around you? And that will put people off into not dealing with you. Everybody around you is a reflection of you. You're a reflection of your peers. People judge the people around you or judge you by the people around you. You know, you always hear people cry about, oh man, my parents this, my brothers this, my homeboys this. They're all complaining how these people aren't looking out for them, aren't showing them love. But they never stop to ask themselves, why does all these people around me don't fuck with me? It's always everybody else's fault. So there's this, so that being said, there's different levels of hustles. You got the dudes that eat at the table. You got the dudes that eat off the floor. That's just, um, I've, it's not like literal, but I don't know the terminology for that, but you understand what I mean. But the people that eat off the floor, they might have had a chance to be at the table at one time or another, but either they got greedy or they came up short. So they got kicked out of the car and now they gotta become scavengers. You know, when you come into the penitentiary, if you're, a decent in, if you're a decent individual, somebody around you is gonna see that and they're gonna give you an opportunity. And then it's up to you how you do with that opportunity. How I got in, in the beginning, was I worked at the dental lab when I was in Lompoc. And my homeboy Rudy, we, be, we weren't homeboys at the time. He's from a Texas M.A. We lived in the M block, the same block, and we worked in a dental lab. Like we had interactions and stuff, and we felt each other out. Like there was, but well, you never know. But, but for the most part, he felt that I was a good kid, that I was somebody that carried myself a certain way that I could be trusted. He came to me with four balls of heroin. I've never seen heroin in my life until I went to the penitentiary. And when I say four balls, the shit was about this big and maybe that round, like quarter size, packed up. He had four of them. He said, hey, this is what I got. I'm looking at him. I'm like, uh, and? He's like, well, here's two for you and two for me to bring back into the unit. And I'm like, well, how the hell am I supposed to do this in my head? I'm not saying out loud. The only thing I'm saying when I when he presented me with the opportunity was like, yeah, I got it, yeah. But now I'm like, man, how the hell am I gonna bring this back? Because when you leave the dental lab, they pat you down. They make you take off your shoes, they pat you down, and sometimes they might even strip search you, depending on who's working at the corridor. So, you know, first time I tried to put in my shoe, but it, it didn't work. I got a bulge in my shoe, that's very obvious. I couldn't flatten it out and put it at the bottom of my feet. So I tried to find little places in my clothing that I could slip it in. And none of it worked out, or none of it was to my satisfaction because this is a brand new case. If I get caught with this freaking two balls of heroin, which I'm pretty sure are about an ounce each, a piece, or maybe more. That's more dope I ever seen in my life. You know, I didn't deal with dope out here. You know, I went to prison for robberies, <clears throat> for kidnappings, 
and all the other crazy stuff. I wasn't a hustler out here. I learned how to hustle in the penitentiary. So when I looked at them two balls, my only option left was to put in a suitcase. If nobody knows what the suitcase is, is your butt. For lack of a better term or whatever, you have to, you know, yeah, I still have a PTSD over that. <laughs> no, I'm just joking, but my objective is to get away. And my objective at that time wasn't to show them that I could be trusted because I didn't need to do that. I already know I can be trusted. And they already knew that I could be trusted. So how this was going to play out in their eyes wasn't a concern of mine. I know I was entrusted with these two things and I made sure that I was able to carry, carry it out. And I got it out. I don't want, know if you guys want me to go into details on how I got it out, but yeah, we got some lotion, lube myself up, grit my teeth, and put it away. And I still feel funny about it to this day. But you know, this video is just about, if you want to survive in a penitentiary, your reputation, your face, your name, is gonna be the most important asset that you have. No one cares about how much money you have. No one cares about what gang you're from. And no one gives a fuck about how tough you are. When people that are in a certain position and standing wanna branch out and fuck with somebody, they're gonna watch you. They might watch you for a few months. They might watch you for a few years. And they're gonna ask questions about you with people around you. They're gonna watch, see who you associate yourself with. Because in a penitentiary, there's no escape. You can't hide, you can't live in another city and come drop something off. You're right there in the unit you're right there in the yard. And they already know they have all these walking cameras, inmates that have a lot of time and are trying to find a way to get themselves out of it. So the only thing you have is your name. And if your name is shit, you're gonna have a hard time. If you're a piece of shit now, it's not too late to change. It's not. It's not hard to conduct yourself accordingly. How many times have you heard a story, somebody gave somebody a key and he burned off with it because he came up on 30, 30 grand and he thinks he's rich, but he burns off with it. The people don't come looking for him because the people is able to give you a key. They're not worried. They probably got another hundred more, but you, couldn't see past your nose, you thought you came up, but now your reputation is shot because once you spend all that fucking money and try to go back to somebody else or find a new connect, words are already out. Man, you can't trust that dude, Mason, man. Anything you give him, he's gonna run off with it. So now you're left to doing scavenging, hustling in other ways. But if you would've just did what you were supposed to do, brought that shit back, there have been another warehouse full of shit for you to get. My mentality is, that the mentality that I'm trying to push out here, I'm not here to tell you how to change your life. I'm not here to tell you how to live your life or that you're doing wrong or you're doing good or anything like that. I'm emphasizing no matter what part of the, no matter what side of the law, no matter what field you're in, just conduct yourself with integrity. Be an honest individual. Be somebody that's reliable. Be somebody that's dependable. And I promise you, the door's gonna open for you. Welcome to the penitentiary.